I would like to introduce Daniel Gewertz, who is author, writer, and storyteller, born and bred in Queens, New York. At six years of age, he was found reciting stories to obliging family members and disgruntled friends. And he said, there are few better feelings in the world than hearing an audience laugh and knowing an audience is leaning forward, waiting for your next line with bated breath. As a teen, he loved music and baseball. He knew the 500 major leaguers, as well as the presidents in order, and could recite the Gettysburg Address. Started writing at 15, and then went to work as a journalist, uh, and wrote for the, at, for the Boston Herald for 28 years on music and theater. In the last decade, he has been drawn to writing short memoir pieces and he has finished a novel, Ghost to Genius, and now working on another, A Virgin at Woodstock. He was a winner at the WBUR-FM Zip Code Story Contest. He received first prize for Somerville Story Slam and second prize at the Mass Mouth Story Slam. And when I asked Daniel, why do you see stories as important to our civilization? He said, I think it is vitally important to note the specific, the unique, the individual, the quirky, the fresh in prose, in storytelling. It is in the specific that we find out about ourselves. And again, we are very happy and honored to have Daniel here. And he's here to share a few stories and specifics with all of us this morning. So please give him a round of applause, Daniel Gowers. This is called The Eve of the Iguana. I spent New Year's Eve 1962 tending to a mortally ill iguana. It was the very first night in my 12-year-old life that my parents had trusted me to stay at home by myself. They were off at a New Year's Eve party for grown-ups only at the nearby apartment of their friends, the Frumans. My 17-year-old brother was off to the unknown, unnamed places he regularly escaped to, places beyond my socially meager imagination. I was left alone with my books, my collections of postage stamps and baseball cards, and a black and white TV turned to New Year's Eve with Guy Lombardo and his Royal Canadian Orchestra. In a mesh cage in front of me was a dry-skinned leathery lizard, an iguana, it had not moved for over a day. How had the iguana arrived in my home? A few months earlier, we had discovered a couple of tiny iguanas in our neighborhood pet store in Queens, New York. They looked so incongruous among the angelfish and the puppies, so surreal beyond our suburban landscape. With a smirk, my brother took to saying every once in a while, let's get an iguana. He'd say it at oddly timed moments. It was funny, but he did seem fascinated by the idea. For Christmas, I decided to buy him the iguana. It would be the ultimate surprise present. I could imagine his delight. It might even give me more access to my often aloof brother and get me a little closer to his cool teenage world. The iguana would be as a gift as hip and unusual as he seemed to me. When I gave the iguana to my brother on Christmas morning, it was only partly wrapped. There were open spaces so the little lizard could gaze. My brother ripped the wrapping paper off the cage, looked inside, and then just seemed perplexed. What is this? He asked illogically. An iguana. Why did you buy me an iguana? You always said we should get one. I was kidding, he said. <laughs> Didn't you know I was kidding? I hadn't. Neither had my parents, who would have surely discouraged the purchase if they had suspected that my brother's fascination was merely an absurdist joke. I looked at the scaly lizard with its miniature monster face. I guess I'll take it, I said. And so the iguana became mine. It ate a little lettuce for a few days, but then the iguana stopped eating completely and grew lethargic. Alarmed, we tried to give the beast back, but there were apparently no returns for lizards on Long Island, not even for store credit. 
<laughs> this was long before iguanas became a fad pet. It was 40 years before the book Iguanas for Dummies was to be printed. Iguanas can grow to six feet tall, it tells us. Most pets die early from stress and insufficient variety of vegetables. At age 12, I was simply not up on the relevant iguana literature. By New Year's Eve, the lizard's hunger strike had lasted five days. I looked at the dry green creature. I poked it delicately with a twig. No movement other than a slight quiver of the neck, an indication of breath. I whiled away an hour reading biographies about Abraham Lincoln and Thomas Alva Edison, both of them recent Christmas presents. I watched an episode of The Real McCoys with Walter Brennan. I worked on my stamp collection. At 10 p.m., the doorbell rang, an uncommon nighttime occurrence in our little queen's house. At the door was a teenage girl with a wild mane of ink black hair, garish red lips, and one of the shortest skirts I had ever seen. She frightened me. Hi, I'm a good friend of your brother. He's not home, I blurted out. Yeah, I know, she said with a weird smile. We're on our way to the party and I just want to use your bathroom. Before I could say okay, she moved deftly past me. She seemed to know the way. A car with a shadowed inhabitant was parked at the curb, motor running. Within a minute, she was out of the bathroom. Thanks, kid, that was a freaking relief, she said, smiling. And then, in our cramped vestibule, she gave me a small peck of a kiss on my cheek. Her hand lightly brushed the side of my face and for a moment caressed it. Her touch, so light, so quick, looked like a casual gesture yet her fingertips left my face hot. For a moment, I felt slightly dizzy, as if I were floating aloft. And then she swiftly opened and closed the door, a rush of icy December air, the only evidence of her visit. I felt bewildered. Alone again, I felt for the first time that night abandoned on New Year's Eve. I returned to my room, to my books, to my TV, and my vigil with the unmoving iguana. At about 11.45 p.m., I poked at the iguana once more. There was only stillness, even the neck still. I nudged the little guy with a twig. It fell over. The lizard was dead. And it was with the corpse of the iguana caged in front of me that I watched our small black and white TV as the ball in Times Square made its descent. It was 1963. Why has this scene stuck with me with such tenacity? Why, these 50 years later, does it still have a shock of dread to it? I have grown used to the details of death in the ensuing years. Consider for a moment that wild black-haired girl kissing me on the cheek at my doorway on December 31st, 1962. In 1966, she married my brother. They divorced 15 years later. Then, in 1998, their only child, a beautiful 28-year-old woman, crashed her bicycle into a truck in Cambridge and died instantly. Consider my parents. On this resurrected night in 1962, they are happy. They are dancing. They are the best-looking couple at the party. They drink, but not enough for their speech to get slurry. They flirt, but not enough to cause any marital danger. My mother is 41 and looks 31. My father has almost all his hair. Their great political father figure, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, may long be dead, but their glamorous peer, Jack Kennedy, is in the White House, healthy and wise. By the day my father dies of pancreatic cancer in 2004, his mind is long gone. I have placed him in Long Island Jewish Hospital for just two weeks before, but my brother has not visited him or my long ailing mother for over two years, God knows why. From Boston, my brother and I traveled together by Greyhound bus, by IND subway line, and by the New York transit system bus to get to my father's hospital room to bid him goodbye. We arrive at his floor, but before we can enter his room, we are stopped by a nurse. She practically tackles us. It seems my father has died just 10 minutes before our arrival. His skin, pale yellow with jaundice, has already grown cold. So, 
With this history, why does the death of a pet iguana still haunt me? It is such a small death, after all. Why does it not feel inconsequential after all these years? Is it just the simple weirdness of a dead lizard in a cage on the first night in this life that I've been left to my own devices? Yes, perhaps. But maybe the iguana's death and a lonely boy's feelings of abandonment on New Year's Eve merely heighten the haunting of that time. The real chill of the memory may go back to Christmas morning one week before. We are all standing around the Christmas tree. The tree's colored light bulbs are turned on despite the bright winter sun slanting through our living room windows. I am agitated by happy anticipation as I wait my turn to present my gift. The moment arrives. I give my brother the iguana, and he refuses my gesture of love. For it is love I am trying to give him. It is acceptance by my big hipster brother that I desire. It is his approval and love I seek. Death comes to everyone, I was told by my father later that week. It isn't judgment. It isn't personal. It comes to presidents, and it comes to lizards. But the topic that haunted me and the conversation that was avoided during that far gone holiday season was about love, specifically what to do about love offered and refused. That was personal. Do we ever figure that one out? Thank you. So uh, the next piece. Uh, is the funnier one. <laughs> and uh, I don't think it needs any introduction. There are some visual aids, so get ready for them. It's called Looking Like a King, A Personal Social History. I have gotten past my share. I've beaten leukemia. I've survived heartbreak, unemployment, and the death of loved ones. My apartment house once burned down with me in it. But there is one life circumstance I cannot seem to rise above. People say I look like Stephen King. <laughs> They've been saying it for 25 years. These people always sound gleeful as if imparting the most enchanting news. Do you know who you look like comes the unbidden question, and the answer never varies. It is worse when there is no question, no emotionally preparatory moment to steal myself. Stephen King, some loon will bellow be it in the middle of a busy parking lot or an idyllic public beach. Tourists seem especially unencumbered by reserve or politeness. Before I go on, let me state this unequivocally. I do not look like Stephen King. We do not share a single facial feature. OK, maybe there's a slight resemblance around the eyes, but the shape of my face, lips, nose, cheeks, forehead, hairline, no similarity whatsoever. Our faces are nearly as mismatched as our incomes. <laughs> Stephen King is one of the richest writers in the world. I am not. <laughs> one thing we once shared, and for many years, is this. We had beards, dark, full beards, and glasses. But come on, is that freaking it? There's just got to be something more. <laughs> The next statement may sound vain, but here goes. I am definitely better looking than Stephen King. <laughs> See, someone here is thinking I'm vain, aren't you? But let me counter this with an admission. After years of contemplating my, my King dilemma, I have come to the regretful conclusion that we may indeed share something. Not a feature, but a characteristic. We may both possess a dark, glowering look. Before this Stephen King affliction, I never knew I glowered. All the photos I found of Stephen King, mostly from book jackets, emphasized his diabolic side. This was clearly a sales gambit. Considering his literary genre, shadowy and scary was obviously chosen by cover jacket designers as King's visual selling point. Sexy and come hither was out of the question. <laughs> I did not relish the thought that scary is the way I come across to the world. Scary photos of a glowering Mr. King helped the novelist sell 500 million books. Glowering has not helped me sell anything. 
I can still be pained by memories of a Saturday night in the early 90s. There I was, a single man entering a music club. I had shaved, showered, trimmed my beard. I had on a new shirt. As I entered the club, a pretty young woman came right up to me and smiled. My heart leapt. Do you know who you look like, she asked merrily. Stephen King, she shouted. And then she swept by me and rejoined her boyfriend. Now maybe the, the, the woman had a thing for King, but all I felt was dismay. Here I was trying to look my best, trying to look friendly and approachable and handsome, and I was told that I looked like a weird-looking horror writer, a writer who tried his hardest to appear gruesome on book jackets. The comment effectively sank my already fragile Saturday night mojo. More recently, another woman in another bar informed me that I looked like King. I told her that Stephen King was not attractive, so I did not consider it a compliment, and the woman seemed honestly baffled. But Stephen King is so talented and famous and rich, she said. How could it not be a compliment? <laughs> there is the nub. In America today, looking like a famous celebrity, any celebrity is apparently thought to be a good thing. Publicly celebrated is what we Americans want to be. So if you already resemble someone famous, you're apparently part way there. When this King thing first started to me, it was long before reality stars and wrestlers adorned the covers of supermarket tabloids. There was only one main type of famous celebrity a person was likely to resemble, a movie star. So when you told a woman she resembled a movie star, you were invariably paying a compliment. You were overestimating. You were rounding up. <laughs> As a young woman, my mother was often told she looked like Hedy Lamarr. One of the most exotic beauties of the era. Was my mother beautiful? Yes, but she was no Hedy Lamarr. Her friends and family were rounding up. My father was told when he grew a pencil mustache in the 40s that he looked like David Niven. Was he as suave as David Niven? No, but his acquaintances were rounding up. Back when he had long hair and a mustache, my older brother was once told by a man on West End Avenue in Manhattan that he looked like Superfly, played by the actor Ron O'Neill. This was the 1970s, and the man may have been insane. But the fact is, saying my bookish, intellectual-looking Jewish brother resembled an African-American sex symbol was a compliment. That man may have been psychotic, but he wasn't insulting. He had enough sense to round up. At some point, I began to worry if this entire cockamamie Stephen King business was karmic payback. What had I done in my early life to cause such an odd fate? Sadly, I came up with one dreadful incident. About 25 years ago, drunk at a party, I was chatting up a tall, robust blonde. I was attempting to flirt. You look like a certain movie star, I said, but I can't remember which one, I told her. Then a little drunker, a little later, it came to me. I figured it out, I said. It'll sound strange, but you look a little like Gary Busey. <laughs> Now, to my debatable credit, I was referring to the blind, blonde, buff surfer boy, 1970s Gary Busey from Big Wednesday, and not the goofy Buddy Holly version, or of course, the present day's crazed, teeth-bearing, old, pop-eyed Gary Busey. But there was no getting around it. As soon as the name Busey slipped past my drunken lips, I saw the blonde girl's face fall, crumble, and then harden. I had goofed big time. There was absolutely nothing I could say to make up for it. I had told an attractive woman she looked like a man, and not even a handsome man. <laughs> In January 2000, I was on my honeymoon on a Royal Caribbean cruise ship with my bride. On board were 2,000 other passengers. I told my new wife that before the 11 days were over, somebody would tell me I looked like Stephen King. She correctly pointed out that I look nothing like King and bet me a five spot that no one would tell me I do. For 10 days, I was, she was winning the bet, and I was pleased. Then, in Key West, our last stop before heading to Miami, we dropped by an outdoor bar restaurant for a drink. The waiter, holding menus, stopped in his tracks. Oh my God, he said, are you Stephen King? He didn't think I looked like King, he thought I was King. This was not an improvement. No, I said, 
I knew you'd say that, countered the waiter, smiling in a confidential way. I'm sure you like your privacy. Don't worry. I won't tell anyone until you leave. It took me several minutes to convince the man that I was an impoverished freelance writer on my honeymoon. In 2004, something encouraging finally happened. Stephen King shaved off his beard. What was even better, he was photographed frequently sitting in Fenway Park during the World Championship Red Sox season. Soon, I reasoned a whole generation of celebrity watchers would grow to know Stephen King as a man who looked nothing like me. This newly beardless Stephen King looked like a predatory yet worried bird. I did not. <laughs> I felt like carrying a photo of the clean-faced king just to prove to whomever still insisted I was his doppelganger that they were in woeful error. But for a while, it didn't look like I had to. The comments began to diminish on their own. Perhaps a year goes by now. I've been lulled into believing I am finally safe. And then I'm struck with a surprise attack. Has anyone ever said, you look like Stephen King? And I feel like shouting, yes, some people have told me that, and they're all idiots. But I don't do it. What I promise to do instead is this. When I think somebody looks like a celebrity, I promise to stop myself from rashly blurting out my first perception. I promise to make sure I am rounding up. I was at a dinner party not long ago. I was sitting opposite an elderly woman. At first, I couldn't figure out who she looked like, but I knew it was somebody. Then it came to me. She actually looked like a combination of two famous people, both homely. They were the late playwright Lillian Hellman and the late Nancy Marchand, the actress who played Tony Soprano's evil mother. I said nothing. Thank you.
have wings to fly Angels have wings Angels have wings to fly And baby, so do you and I Angels have wings to fly Thank you. Our Lady of Guadalupe. Our Lady of Guadalupe appeared during a time of great change. The Spaniards and Mayans face to face, besides all the gold, chocolate, tomatoes, and corn, were exchanged for horses and eggs and metal armor and cooking pots. The Mayans and Spaniards face to face, two worlds colliding when Our Lady of Guadalupe made her entrance. And with one foot on the moon, her aura bright with color, a rounded belly, and a black ribbon close about her neck, she appeared as a miracle, and she has been prayed to ever since. She is watching over the Americas, always pregnant with possibility. Thank you. The first true day of winter, purple and perfect, the last pansy of the season stands guard in the snow. Thank you. Peach and pear.